Hello, I'm Sonal Chaudhary from Hug, and today I have here with me Dr. Vadim Malkov, who's from our product management team. We will be talking today about dechlorination, one of our episodes in Ask the Expert series. So Vadim, thank you for being here. Can you give us an overview of dechlorination? What is it? What is what are its main applications and some challenges associated with it? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Sonal. And um, dechlorination uh, is done, of course, by definition, to get rid of chlorine, residual chlorine. Chlorine in the water present for disinfection purposes. And yes, it's very beneficial from multiple standpoints, healthcare, first of all, or health of uh, public health, uh, rather. However, it may be detrimental for either aquatic life when the water is returned to the nature, or it can be detrimental for parts of the process when the industrial applications, or can be detrimental for specifically membranes, um, our own membranes to be more exact. So from those standpoints, chlorine must be removed. Removed to what extent? It also uh, depends on application. So major applications where chlorine is removed is uh, uh, municipal wastewater applications. When the water is returned to the nature, natural water bodies, and receiving water bodies, they do not, should not have any chlorine present in the above specified limits. Um, or dechlorination is done when the chlorine is detrimental for the processed water, produced water in the ultra pure water conditions or processes, um, industries such as beverage production, food production, pharma, electronics, you name it, multiple industries. It can be associated also with the RO membrane filtration process because chlorine, presence of chlorine above very low limits is detrimental for the membrane structure and integrity. And RO membranes are used nowadays ubiquitously uh, across multiple industries, not only in ultra pure water production, but also in the drinking water production mm -hmm. when desalination, you name it. So this is where it's used and why chlorine is removed. Mm -hmm. So how do customers dechlorinate? What are some of the processes that they use? Yeah, very good question. Uh, normally, mainly, there are two processes are being used for getting rid of chlorine. It's either adsorption based or physical, physical chemical properties of uh, granulated activated carbon or sometimes powdered activated carbon, but rare. Sometimes it's charcoal, sometimes it's anthracite, but mainly it's GAC, granulated activated carbon, adsorption based or chemicals, chemical reduction of chlorine mm -hmm. using sulfide based chemicals. It may be sodium bisulfite, sodium metabisulfite, maybe other chemicals of such type. There are other processes, other chemicals used less frequently, like ascorbic acid sometimes is used for dechlorination. There are also other physical processes such as UV irradiation is used for dechlorination because it um, destroys the chlorine in its form uh, as it is. But those are a rare process. The mainstream is a GAC-based adsorption and sulfide-based, mainly sodium bisulfide-based uh, chemical reduction. Sometimes it's SO2-based. It's a large scale wastewater operations, for example, they use gas, SO2 gas. So in terms of uh, challenges associated with dechlorination, can you, can you elaborate more on that topic? Absolutely. There are multiple challenges as with any process like this. And um, um, mainly it's underuse or overuse of chemicals. Mm -hmm. And also uh, what is the, um, what is the, conditions of the GAC, the granulated carbon beds, or carbon beds they called, or sometimes GAC tanks. Uh, there are multiple names for this. What are the conditions of this, of this media? Does it have to be replaced? Is it time to replace it now? Is it channeling, developing this particular specific channels for chlorine to pass through without necessarily regeneration? Or does it have to be cleaned now? So all those challenges, both overuse, underuse of chemicals, which is associated with the chemical cost of the process, or risk of letting chlorine through with the carbon beds. Those processes come down to one major or one common denominator, monitoring and accurate detection of chlorine in the dechlorinated water. 
Before we go into the monitoring piece, uh, I wanted to elaborate a little bit more on the challenges associated with GAC. So you mentioned GAC channeling. Can you, can you explain more? What does that mean? How does that occur? Absolutely. So mainly, if we look at the media of this granulated activated carbon, it's a basically charcoal which was boiled in alcohol to clean all the all the small, very small canals within those granules. So th those granules can absorb contaminants. In this particular case, it's contaminants of multiple kinds coming in the city water. It may be, uh, but we are focusing on chlorine. So chlorine needs to be absorbed and captured by those granules and be you know kept tight inside those small canals within each granule which creates huge surface area which definitely helps the absorption now when in the specific granules the sides of them they get saturated with those contaminants being chlorine or something else and they cannot absorb anymore and sometimes this media it uh because of it's sitting there in a bed in a tank like without a lot of movement, it develops those channels within the media between the granules where the surface of nearby granules is already saturated. And then chlorine cannot get absorbed through these particular channels. It's not necessarily straight channels. They can be elaborated channels, but what if we'll find those channels and chlorine will not get absorbed? And then all of a sudden, yeah, the bed may, may have been regenerated recently, but because it was not, uh, cleaned properly or there was no process there was not agitated as necessary the channels being formed and chlorine starts coming through leaking through mm -hmm. basically and it's not easy to detect that situation or detect the leakage if the regeneration or cleaning is based on a time schedule it's like once a month or something mm -hmm. so you need to con continuously monitor that right to be able to detect something like this that is correct and now we're coming to continuously monitoring there is a lot of different definitions because for some uh, users continuous means once a shift or once a day which is not necessarily continuous it may be right. continual now we need to define continuous as well mm -hmm. um it, before again before we go into monitoring wanted to talk a little bit more about sps so you mentioned that as another method to de dechlorinate what are some of the challenges there? You said we could, there is a risk of overfeeding, underfeeding. What happens if I overfeed or underfeed in my process? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Of course, by definition, underfeeding means leaving too much chlorine in the water, mm -hmm. which may be detrimental for either receiving water body or the process or the RO membranes if that process is involved, which is usually the case. Mm -hmm. Overfeeding, it's Re removing all chlorine, which is, again, achieving the goals potentially. However, presence of uh, sulfite-based, salt sulfite-based chemicals in the water, it um, creates conditions for specific uh, sulfur-reducing bacteria to strive and grow and create biofilm of different kind of bacteria in the water, in the uh, water pipes or in whatever canals, channels are following the dechlorination. And if it's membranes, it's biofouling of the membranes, which definitely contributes to, to reduced flux of the membranes or reduced production of the filtered water, mm -hmm. which means detrimental consequence for the process. So underfeeding is potentially exposing membranes or the process produced water to excess of chlorine, which is detrimental for either membrane or, or, the, or the water itself, for the water quality. Overfeeding is creating conditions for biofouling, mm -hmm. excessive biofouling. Thank you so much, Vadim, for your time today. To learn more about this, visit hawk.com webpage for ULR CL17SC.